Recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectible, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. Oh my woofness. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. I'm Eric. Welcome to issue number 284 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. On this week's show, we're going to have a club discussion for the one shot of My Little Pony Black, White, and Blue. Then we're going to jump into the weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth and we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old, we're going to talk about them there. Then in our news segment, it's going to be part one of two of our previews preview. Uh, this time we're going to cover the Marvel and DC Comics December 2023 catalogs for products coming out in February 2024 and beyond. So that is the lineup. Let's jump right into the club discussion. Here we go, My Little Pony, Black, White, and Blue. Sorry, every pony. It seems our printer ran out of pink, purple, yellow, green, red, uh, well, all the colors except black, white, and blue. What to do with all this blue? Hmm. Oh, drum roll, please. In Misty's first comic appearance, every pony's favorite blue pony is in Maritime Bay for a sleepover with the main five. But when every pony wakes up, all the color is gone. It kind of looks like Violet and Sky's favorite old TV show, Betwitched, at least the years it was in black and white. But every pony can still see blue for some reason. Determined to make the best out of a gloomy situation, Vi and Sky put together a plan to spread cheer. Meanwhile, Izzy helps the distraught Misty see the beautiful in messy situations uh, using the power of unicycling. Join us for a magical one-shot of color calamity before returning to your regularly scheduled programs. This issue is done by T. Franklin, Agnes Garboska, Heather Breckel, Joanna Natali, and Riley Farmer. All right, this is the one-shot from My Little Pony. Um, Title-wise, it seems to be fitting the uh, the trend of, uh, we often talk about the uh, Marvel and DC, Black, White, and Red, and Blood, and all those kind of Wonder Woman, you know, gold, all that kind of stuff. But this time we're jumping into the Pony u- universe, and rather than doing a bunch of short stories uh, to kind of give the structure of this issue before we dive into it, um, we meet our uh, new pony, which I didn't know was brand new to the, the canon here until reading the synopsis but misty um basically uh coming across an artifact which eventually is uh taking away all the color and all the power from uh their area here and that leads to a black white and blue scenario uh misty's the only one remaining in color um but uh, the the structure of the story is kind of a a reverse Wizard of Oz, if you will, with kind of starting with the colorful world and then explaining why this comic is done in black, white, and blue. So it does kind of have some sort of, uh, you know, parody element to the the style of the story with the title, um, but it actually gives it a, you know, makes it a, a full-on story rather than multiple short stories. So this is just kind of the overall setup. The synopsis said quite a bit. So what we're going to do is jump right into uh, discussing this and our thoughts. Um, Eric, what's your thoughts on uh, My Little Pony, uh, Black, White, and Blue? I think if you enjoy it and it makes you happy, good. That's an excellent review. Let's jump over to Katie. Uh, Thoughts on this issue? um your audio might be on mute just fyi we muted we muted yep all right so i did read this um i liked it i do have a couple of notes so first of all i want to praise their creativity i do feel like you know they saw the black and white and red whatnot idea and wanted to make it their own so i thought that they did a good job of that um certainly the story is very creative i will say um it got a little 
it, it could have used a little bit tighter editing in some places for me because it got a little bit off track with the ponies, you know, goofing off at the sleepover and then the fashion show and then the beach. One of those things could have gone for me. It did clog down the story a little bit. Um, so I feel like that could have used some tighter editing. Um, I, you know, my little pony books typically have a moral and I think they actually do a really good job of it, right? Sometimes comic books can get a little bit preachy with their morals or their ideas and you're like geez like I, I just wanted to read a book to be entertained but my little pony does an excellent job of balancing that with entertaining you with making you feel like the the moral and the virtues they're trying to impart come about very naturally um they're definitely presented in a way that is you know kid friendly but also still relatable to adults there was a um, I guess somebody watched uh, the peanuts recently there was a little therapy session between misty and one of the other ponies um and she's you know talking about like you know i want to be friends with people but i feel like all i do is break everything and no matter what i do they're going to yell at me and i'm so afraid of you know not being perfect and making a mistake that hurts someone and i'm like dang i've i've said the same thing in therapy like y'all are y'all are telling the truth here for real um yeah i thought that was actually very touching and yeah my little pony consistently does those kind of discussions and stories really well in my opinion from what i've read um uh the ending where they brought the color back was super cute and was very nice um uh, pretty my mom julie everyone hi say hi mom hello mother <laughs> um, hi, <man. laughs> they all say hi um i liked it it was I'm not going to say it's a must read. I'd say it's solidly okay. And actually the My Little Pony comics overall have been pretty good. So I would say they're worth giving a try. Um, and definitely accessible to young readers. I would have no problem giving this to a kid or reading it with them. And um, overall, pretty good. I enjoyed it. You know, I had my few notes, but uh, I appreciated it. So that's my thoughts on My Little Pony, Black, White, and Blue. What does everyone else think? Cool. Let's jump over to Kirby. Thoughts? <laughs> uh, this is... It's good for kids and stuff. I just... I was disappointed because I was expecting the black, white, and red treatment, black, white, and blue, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Layout where you had at least two or three short stories. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that they gave us about 10 pages of color. To start us mm -hmm. out, I think instead of, I like the Bewitched crossover, but I think instead of doing this, they could have just had Misty play the Crypt Keeper type character and mm -hmm. give us one page where Misty goes up to this item and does something to it and then everything goes black, white, and blue instead oh, of going so many pages into it before it happens. Because Misty goes up to this device that she has no idea what it is. She falls in a hole, finds this device, but she knows which button to push. And when I'm looking at this thing, I wouldn't know what the heck to push. There's a bunch of little gems and stuff on it. So, <laughs> but she all of a sudden knows how to operate this and works it through. And then I'm like, okay, we're finally getting to the black, light, white, and blue. But we don't get black, white, and blue. We get black, white, gray, purple, green, mauve, and we get all these versions of blues and grays and blacks, and it just kind of throws it off for me. I mean, I get a, I can see a light blue, a dark blue, something like that, but mixing in with the greens and stuff, it just bringing the aquas in and stuff, it just, I don't know, it, it kind of threw me off. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the peanuts parody and stuff that they had through here and the little parodies that they did put in uh but i didn't realize ponies talk so dang much <laughs> this is a very wordsy comic for ponies yeah. <laughs> i expected it to be more of the somewhat silent storyline like we see with other animal storylines but yeah other than that, it's a good story. It's a complete story and everything like that. I just, I was looking for that 
mixed short story treatment that we've been getting from all the other ones previous to this. That's what kind of threw me off. But yeah, it's and it was with my MS brain, it messed with me a lot when they kept using the different pony things, talking about all the ponies, the different names for the group wise and stuff. At first I thought that was actual ponies names <laughs> that they're calling out. So once that clicked in my brain, it helped. <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, I like dump I like dumpster diver pony myself. <laughs> is my favorite one. <laughs> um yeah, and I, I understand that about expecting, you know, short stories, especially following the model that the other publishers have been doing. Uh, but that's what ended up surprising me uh, the most with liking it. When opening up, you know, I did start seeing the first color pages and I had to look back at the cover being like, I bought the right one, right? Um, so I did have to double check that. But then I saw what was happening, the idea of setting up this story and kind of, you know, making a, a reason. I like the whole reason behind uh, everything kind of being washed out. Um, especially with the double splash page there of seeing like their little uh, kingdom area there and just mm -hmm. seeing the color being kind of sucked up and leaked out and all that kind of stuff. So I really dug the setup. And then as we jump into the story, um, it wasn't going to be as chaotic as I thought it was going to be. I like how they were very positive about being like, hey, let's go ahead and bring cheer and keep everybody busy and try to entertain and jumping in. You know, they got the jumping rope games. They have a bunch of other games and they got the, you know, setting up a fashion show and all that kind of stuff. So I like the idea of uh, that. It really wasn't that menacing um, while it could have felt like that. But you just get the uh, Misty's reaction of how bad she felt throughout the entire issue, issue knowing that she was... Uh, you know, the cause of this and not really, you know, with her kind of coming to terms and realizing that nobody hated her for it. And I think this is the one I was talking about, like, well, you just made a mistake or it was an accident and, and, you know, her just kind of realizing that. So I do like that it, uh, it didn't like end up going very dark and, and scary and they, they, they still found joy, even though when all their color disappeared um and then it looks great too once it comes back in those final final moments that katie touched on uh earlier talking about the the color coming back and so i really dug it on that level i've read a handful of uh, my little pony comics going back to the 2013 2014 maybe and uh remember hearing a bunch of reviews on the podcast i listened to and just being like wow a lot of people are really into this and I checked it out and that's when uh, Katie Cook was working on the book and she is awesome. And, uh, and the books were just so, so funny. And I like the word play and the, the puns and, you know, these books will always say the word pony in one form or another, at least mm -hmm. 50 <laughs> times in an issue. So that is something uh, to it. <laughs> that is expected um, going forward. Cause they usually every pony and all that kind of stuff. And any, anytime they can twist the word and make a, like a horse pun you know they'll, they'll take that opportunity but but yeah as a one shot i thought it was fun i think it's a good introductory thing if people uh don't know much about it like there's really you don't get into you don't need to get into the explanation of uh equestria and all this stuff like it just you just get it and it's fun and yeah. um, you can definitely see there were some uh classic television uh, bewitch fans as far as the writing team goes because that's just such a you know uh, a funny thing to kind of throw into like a pop culture reference to throw into a comic that are generally going to be for most people that have no idea what that is so and you yeah. get that a lot with the katie cook friendship is magic books too where you just get all of these references where much like a pixar movie that you know the kids are going to laugh and giggle and enjoy it and the parents are going to enjoy it too you know just the when getting references that are meant for the older audiences too so yeah but yeah but yeah i, I dug it kirby, over uh, yeah i was gonna say i think kirby brought up a good point that maybe while i'm really glad we got a continuous story i do feel like some of that could have been a backup story especially like the stuff where misty's not really involved like the fashion show would have been a fun backup story and that i think would have made the main story a little bit more cohesive and then give us kind of that POV of, well, what's everyone else in town doing without feeling like it, it kind of is 
sticking out at an odd angle in the rest of the story. So I think that would have helped it in my opinion, but yeah, I still agree with, you know, it was a fun one. What do you think? And when you reference the main story, are you talking about like Maine? Like, um, oh, yeah, characters? yes, yeah, exactly. Yep, the Mains, the ponytails, exactly. You got it. Oh, uh, it's like the some pony, any, any, any pony, and all these different pony references <laughs> at first to first, probably 10, 15 pages. And I'm like, is this a who's on first parody? <laughs> it is, yeah, it, it's pretty that's repetitive, good... but that is a, uh, yeah, that's. As far as I know, that's a common thing. But yeah, it, I can see that being, you know, very questionable for a newer audience. <laughs> yeah, I, I did find that a little weird when I first started reading the MLP comics. Not I'm not a regular reader, but it, it, they, I got to tell you, they have committed to it. So I respect them for that. that they're like, oh, no, we're not dropping the stick. <laughs> yeah, committed anyway. is a good, good word for it. So. <laughs> but yeah. Well, that's going to do it then um, for uh, My Little Pony Black, White, and Blue, uh, the one shot, and uh, that just kind of, you know, it was another chapter in our uh, animal uh, club picks that just kind of seemed to be, uh, you know, by coincidence, because we've been talking about Marvel Unleashed, which we have one issue left. It is available now, uh, but we will uh, talk about it uh, in the future. We have an It's Jeff One Shot once again, which is currently out. As of the week of this recording, the Howard the Duck number one one shot came out. So those are just a couple of the animal books that we'll be talking about here in the club discussion on our show, as well as uh, reaching the possible final arc of Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. Just as we get to the end, then they add a couple more issues. So we'll we'll see uh see how far we are and then there's twist the might before christmas number one which is set to come out in december here so that is a lineup for some upcoming club discussions but before we get to any of those we have to go to the next segment welcome to the weekly reviews the first one i am bringing up is a book that has been uh uh in the works for a while and uh here it is super fun all together cactus and liz what happens when a cactus and a lizard are minding their own business and get sucked into an alternate dimension? They go corporate and have to find help getting back home by going to infinity with the help of a caseworker, Apple Blossom, no, the saying another My Little Pony book, and her robot helper, Steve. Uh, this comic is done by Franco, Nicholas F. Or Orleani, that's why Franco just goes by Franco and Eric Wolfgang. So um, this is a book that is uh, right here in my hands. This is something that's been teased behind the scenes. Um, I got a little tip off of this a while back when in conversation with Eric Wolfgang, a book that he was going to illustrate for Franco. Franco, uh, someone who we often talk about on this show. Here he is on my shirt uh, for today's episode. Um but yeah, here it is. This is a one-shot comic that is put out by Aya oh yeah, Comics as well as Franco's studio, Blind Wolf uh, Studios, and it's a, you know, it's it's a brand new adventure. You don't need to know anything before jumping into something like this. Uh, this is a story, as the synopsis mentioned, about Cactus and Liz, which uh, Cactus and Liz, uh, they are a cactus and a lizard, as we see here in the panels, and. Um, Basically, we open up the story where they're in a desert and the lizard kind of comes up and basically needs to uh, get in the shadow of this cactus. Uh, it's super hot out. There's no water nearby. And and just all of a sudden he sees the, uh, the Liz sees the cactus and has to run over there, get some shade. But Cactus isn't too happy about that and gets a little angry saying, hey, get, get out of here. Get out of here. Um so this kind of sets up this whole like desert scenario, but then what gets into the crazy adventure is that there is this um, this kind of U-Haul type of truck that it just happens to be driving, uh, you know, on the the cliff nearby across the desert, and some things start to spill out of it, and without giving anything away because it's a one shot, something that spills out of it basically sets us off onto this adventure as it kind of comes in contact with uh, Cactus and Liz. And Cactus and Liz are going through this kind of um, this 
dimensional space. Uh, they meet uh, Apple Blossom and this uh, robot Steve. And uh, as they meet these characters, they're kind of finding out that in this alternate dimension space, they can basically kind of achieve um, anything they want. And it's very surprising when you find out what does Cactus and Liz actually want. Uh, that's as much as I kind of want to tease on that, just because, you know, once again, that's a one shot, independent, self published type of comic. Um, the art on this is fantastic. Uh, Eric Wolfgang just brings so much life uh, into these designs. Uh, there's so many different uh, backgrounds that we're dealing with, going from the desert, going to this kind of digital universe space. A um, lot like all oh yeah, comics, they'll bring in some uh, real life images as we see there, a cactus there. Um, that's something they like to use that device every now and then where they, they put an actual photograph into an image. Um, but then the character designs, as we meet all these people, we're in a lot of spaces there's a lot of background characters going on. So when you read this book, it's 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 quite a large uh, issue for five bucks. Uh, so you're definitely getting your money's worth. But with the art, you're just getting so much to to look into the background. Um, there may or may not be an oh yeah comics related Easter egg somewhere in there. So if you're familiar with their universe, it's kind of like a Where's Waldo situation. Um, but some of these characters, we go to an amusement park. We just see so many different creatures and aliens and designs. And uh, it's it's like you're reading like a Scotty Young type of book. I'm sure this is something that uh, Eric Wolfgang has probably heard many a times, whether or not, you know, it's definitely a compliment, but it might get to a point that if you hear it so much, just being like, well, I'm not Scotty Young. I'm not, you know, Eric has his own style. But if you like Scotty Young books and know nothing about Eric Wolfgang, I think you would really uh, love the adventure in here. Here's an awesome shot of a scary tree guy. That wrote, that's kind of really gives you the idea of like a Scotty Young type of world. Um, but yeah, the character designs are just excellent. So much fun. Kind of trippy. There's some moments where you almost feel like it's a 3D book, but it's not. So it just kind of takes... Adventure is basically a great word for it. Um, so yeah, this is a self-published comic. You can get this from uh, blindwolfstudios.com uh, through Franco's site, amongst other things he has on his shop. Or you can get it through Eric Wolfgang, which is ericwolfgang.square.site. And that's Eric with a C. Or at a oh yeah comics shop, they'll have them. I think they've been shipped out. I know Eric Wolfgang. By the time this episode release, um, he's doing a signing at Skokie. I won't be at that one, um, but yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure the shops got their shipments. Uh, whether you're in the New York, uh, Illinois, or for uh, the Muncie area, so yeah, this is a fun comic. It's a one shot. It's five bucks. It's well worth the price, a lot of comic here. And then both of their websites have a lot of different stuff, uh, whether it's comics and art and prints and stickers and stuff. So definitely highly check out uh, both of those websites and uh, check out Super Fun Altogether. And I should mention that uh, Nicholas, who is a co-writer on this with Franco, that is Franco's son, Nicholas. So Nicholas has uh, grown up to uh, be a writer with his dad here. So that's just that's an awesome little bonus. And as I just said the word bonus, the last thing I'm going to tease, because I didn't know this existed, but apparently this idea must have been floating around with Franco and his son for quite a while. And I don't want to show everything here, so let me block it out. Um, but it originally must have started as a comic strip. I'm assuming it never got published, that this is probably the first time the public is seeing it. But when you read some of these comic strips uh, done in a newspaper comic strip style, um, you could see how Eric Wolfgang has taken a, a script and turned it from a comic strip into a just a wide you know, full on comic adventure. So that was a fun little bonus in there. So that's all I got to say about super fun altogether. Cactus and Liz available from blind wolf studios and all yeah, comics. Sven Gooley fell down as I was tripping over my words there. Okay. Moving on to Kirby. What you got? Uh, we got midnight suns trade paperback. This collects midnight suns. Number one to five, a dark prophecy and Apocalyptic new villains with horrifying powers. 
the likes of which Earth has never faced before, ordains a specialist team to form and tear shit up. Standing in the way of the coming storm are Magic, Wolverine, Blade, Spirit Rider, Nico Minoru. But what does the terrible threat they face have to do with the Sorcerer Supreme's past? And why is Strange Academy student Zoe, Zoe Lavu number one on their list? The Suns must undertake the darkest and most horrifying journey imaginable to secure aid from one of the most ancient and dangerous beings in all existence. But what terrible secret is the sorceress Agatha Harkness hiding? It's time for the dark side of the Marvel Universe to shine. Featuring Clea, Wong, Doctor Doom, and more. I uh, picked this up because I love the characters. I love the cover. I like the, that you got Blade, Wolverine together in here. I like the spirit. Ghost Rider character is, I believe, the first time I met her. She's very interesting. Uh, it's, I was debating on it because of the witchcraft part of the storyline. I'm not big on that. But Agatha Harkness, I liked her in this story. Uh, she kind of fell into my comfort zone reading this a little bit more with her. But working with her and all these characters, they got these like black entities that just came through a realm into our, well, whichever world they're in. I mean, our, it starts out in our current Earth, and then it kind of bounces around a little bit. I did and didn't like the Sorcerer Supreme character that we get later on in the book he happens to be tony stark the sorcerer supreme i didn't really get tony stark at first but i guess when you look the old man drunken tony stark maybe with the gray gray beard and stuff but yeah it was kind of goofy seeing him as a sorcerer supreme but it did work for this storyline uh it starts out talking about them dealing with certain vampires and stuff from their past. So I was hoping that storyline would have took over more of the witchcraft part of it, but it stayed focusing on the witches because Agatha and her like college, yeah, I would say college day coven that she was part of. They got together, and then they end, one of the witches did some, some spell that ended up taking one of the coven members and kind of giving them to a demon so they'd get powers from the demon. And with that happening, she got stuck in this black mirror environment, stuck behind the mirror and with the demon, and he controlled her and she ends up gaining power from the demon and she's a main reason that Agatha Harkness ends up having to deal with it. Here's our entity that everybody's after in the beginning. He's just one of those black creatures with like a has like a headpiece that reminds me of uh, Silent Hill. Those type of demons from that video game. But Dr. Doom comes, everybody starts coming after this young witch who she keeps turning to, well, they say she's turning into a zombie. She almost looks more like she's turning into stone, but she has this uh, necklace that keeps her in human form. And then when she loses the necklace, she goes into her zombified form. Which, of course, there's a bunch of pictures of her, but I can't find it when I want to find it. But they sit there, and there she is. Her and Agatha go to where the main mirror is. And apparently the mirror has to do with that girl's family's history. 
and the mirror's handed down to her. But yet that's where the evil entity is hiding from and sending the demons through. And she's got to decide whether to break the mirror and hopefully stop the entities from coming through. And at the same time, we got all our midnight suns just battling away, trying to survive all them, all those creatures coming through. I liked it. It teases that there might be more of this story with them in future collaborations, which I hope so. So I like this group of characters. But yeah, it's the whole Doctor Strange thing is always weird to me. We get a couple different Doctor Stranges in here, but Doctor Strange always likes to put the groups together. You go do the stuff, and then even in here in his corporal form, he sits there and watches them deal with demons getting their butts kicked, and he can't do nothing about it. It's like <laughs> it's like Doctor Strange. Why why are you <laughs> why do you get them together to fix things but you're never there to really help them fix things it just puts the group together but yeah i really like this group of characters i hope they do battle together some more in the future <laughs> cool, cool, cool. oh and the collaboration is done by ethan Sachs, luigi luigi sigaria alberto Fo fox <laughs> Antonio Fabella and DC's Joe Sabino and David Nakayama. I've always wondered who this DNA character is, and now I know it's David Nakayama because I love his artwork and I see it a lot on covers. So now I know what DNA stands for. There you go. Good, good. Just a little DNA test right there to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's jump over to Katie. What you got for us? Okay, so this week I have Blue Book, Volume 1 from Dark Horse Comics. It's by a collaboration between James Tinney and the Fourth and Michael Avon Oming. Uh, the letters are by Aditya Bidikar, and then the art is Michael Avon Oming, and the script is James Tinney and the Fourth. All right, so I didn't plan for this, but this is also my black, white, and blue book. Um, it is... So it would seem that James Tinney and the Fourth has a, an interest in UFOs. Um, this is a comic book telling the story of the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. This is a seminal story uh, in American UFO lore and has then gone on to shape other stories. Uh, so you may have heard some elements of this, but basically it starts with uh, Betty and Barney Hill are a couple on a road trip they had gone up to canada and they were running late so they're like we're just going to drive through the night and and come back home to the states so they're driving in the middle of nowhere this is uh in 1961 so you know no cell phones no internet uh, you know tv had just barely become a thing most people didn't have it yet um they're in the middle of nowhere driving it's late at night they're tired they've had a rough year so they're feeling kind of stressed all of a sudden outside their window, Betty sees this weird circle in the sky. And she's like, well, that's, that's weird. Like, what is that? Right. It's not the moon. And all of a sudden it's following them and getting closer. So she's like, Barney, pull over. So she gets out, grabs their binoculars and is trying to look at this thing in, in the sky. And she's really wigged out by it. And Barney's like, just get back in the car. Like it's late. I want to go home. And she's like, no, you need to look at this. And all of a sudden there's, they look through the binoculars. There's this disc in front of the moon, a black disc with little lights all over it. Um, and they're just feeling really weird. And Barney's like, dude, we got to get in the car. Like, we, we need to go. Like, don't think about it. We need to go. And they're in the car. This light gets brighter. This disc keeps following them and gets bigger until it's right in front of them. And Barney can see that there are figures inside of these windows in the disc. And they're really 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 upset now and then then the hills end up missing time they wake up it's two hours later they're back in their car and th they just feel like something is really really wrong so they're like you know what we, we just gotta get home right and they make it home they're really trying to forget about what happened that night because like they just have no frame of reference for whatever that was, but it was so upsetting. And unfortunately, what they experienced won't let them go, right? It keeps coming back up in their minds. They're having dreams about it. Uh, Betty's calling up a scientist acquaintance to be like, 
you know, she wants to like go and set a magnet out on her car to like see if the compass goes haywire or not. And it, it's all over the place. So they can't let it go. And at the same time, the government is running an investigation into UFOs called Project Blue Book, uh, where this book is named from. I hope we'll get more about that in later books. The Hills end up deciding that they can't not live with answers. So they end up seeing a psychologist who specializes in using hypnotism to recover memories. And this is where it gets really, really spooky. So the Hills under, under hypnosis describe being taken on board this flying saucer by humanoid figures who uh, run a bunch of medical tests on them and some of them are indifferent and others seem to be pretty sympathetic to them. And something I thought that this book did that was really cool is it actually showed us the inside of the spaceship. It dramatized for us uh, the Hills experience. And that was both spooky and also has quite a bit of an element of wonder to it. Um, I, I don't know that I would have been as okay as they were if I had experienced this <laughs> um and then betty asks the aliens for some proof that what she's experiencing is real and they're like hey you can take this book with you right and in the book um there's an a, a map a map to where the aliens are from and then one of the other aliens makes betty give the book back and they put them back in their car and and that's the end of the alien encounter but eventually this story gets out to the press the psychologist that was working with them was doing a uh, presentation at a conference and a member of the press was there and heard it and this ufo story got written up by the ap and went out all throughout the country and became just this you know huge sensation um and then there were people trying to debunk what the hills experienced or offer alternatives. This story does not go into them, even though there are some other alternatives, some more some more plausible than others. Um, and then somebody tries to take the star chart that Betty had drawn from memory and try and figure out where these aliens came from to see if you know maybe this this uh, constellation does exist. So that was pretty interesting. Betty uh, remained a believer until the very end of her life. Uh, she spoke at all kinds of conferences. She did pass away in 2004. And the book at the very, very end with Betty is an old lady. We see the aliens come back in their spaceship and uh, Barney is there and he, he grabs her and takes her into the spaceship. And then we see on earth, Betty passes away. Um, I really, really liked this. Um, I'm not qualified scientifically or spiritually to say whether or not this is true, but I know that it is an incredibly good story that is so foundational to our image of like, what do aliens and flying saucers look like? Um, Michael Avon Oming and James Tinney in the forest seem to be approaching this from the idea that this is true, uh, but it's a very well done book. I really enjoyed it. Um, the visuals are awesome they managed to convey both fear but also a sense of like wonder and hope and I appreciated that I find aliens scary and I, I mean if aliens abducted me and started running tests on me like that would probably just be it for me <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna try and survive that um, so really interesting way to present this um, I liked it quite a bit I saw in the catalog, there's a volume two coming. So I'm really excited for that. Um, again, the story isn't new, but I thought this was a really cool way to present it. Um, I, it's It hits all the right notes and I really enjoyed it. I If you like UFO stories, it's, it's in the zeitgeist right now. Everyone's talking about it. You will probably enjoy this book. Um, it might not be a new story for you, but it's a new way to present the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. I really enjoyed it. That's my review of Blue Book Volume 1 from Dark Horse Comics. Check it out. And then while we talked about a Volume 2 coming, you know, uh -huh. we had mentioned this a while back too, and uh, Kirby mentioned it from the catalog, and uh -huh. um, I think I talked about Issue 1 a while back and did a little extra extensive research to find out mm -hmm. that there's actually more stories with Betty and Barney that actually go back like a long uh -huh. time ago, like they're in this uh -huh. like kind of like this little town of bedrock 
and you know <laughs> neighbors Fred and Wilma. So I highly check it out. It's an animated series. I think it's tied into the same universe. Oh. Uh, um, what you got? You had me buying you for real there. <laughs> I wrote that like when you started it. Oh my god! The whole interview, I had to write it down to make sure that I could <laughs> deliver that, and here we are. Eric, what you got? Hold on. I bet nobody saw this coming from me. Um, we just finished the last Punisher run, and Marvel has put out another run of the Punisher. This time, someone completely different, despite the fact that the Punisher has existed for about 50 years, with no one else taking up the Punisher mantle. So as we know, in the last one run, since it was a club pick, we know that Frank Castle is no more, at least not in this world. It opens up with two detectives looking, you know, they're looking over the scene of a house that blew up. And I guess it's fairly suspicious because houses just don't spontaneously blow up. And they then they realize, hey, wait a minute, why is this one wall still here? And they find an explosive. It turns out that this was the home of a man named Joe Garrison, who was said to be an, a retired accountant, which, you know, isn't true. He actually turned out to be a grave digger for S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, the grave diggers, I guess, are the Black Ops stuff, where probably Nick Fury would probably just say, okay, it would be nice if somebody did this, but I know nothing. And then send the guy in and essentially he got all his assets. He got his, uh, you know, he had handlers, but, you know, when they needed something done and couldn't be on the books, this was one of the guys they said in. And I guess the Gravediggers had their own special ballistic plating, which kind of, you know, gives him the look of the skull. So he's tracked down the person who blew up his house to what's called the Demon Club, where if you have a lot of money, you can go there and these people in Oni masks and electric weapons will protect you, supposedly. However, he doesn't he uh, doesn't really agree with them protecting, and he goes off just killing them left and right. One of my favorite kills is where he ends up in the back of the bar. He smashes some rum on one of the demons' face. And, and the demon says, is that all you've got, American? I wield the power of man's darkest shadows. And he's like, maybe, but you're still soaked in rum. So... At this point, he hasn't identified himself as the Punisher, but since he was witnessed and everybody saw what they thought was the skull, they're like, oh, look, the Punisher's back, or some Punisher's back. We find out that one of his old handlers is helping him. Her name is Triple A, which uh, stands for Arms and Analysis. Essentially, they were the ones who uh, set up you know, the off-the-books uh, weapon storage sites and everything. So, basically, Joe Garrison has his own microchip. Plus, he, all, but he has access to super advanced shield technology. So, he, tr he uses the shield, shield technology to find the guy who, who, you know, busted, blew up his house, Tracks him down using shield special contact lenses that can do bio biometric analysis. And I'm like, yeah, Frank would have loved that stuff, but that's not Frank. So he goes in, he finds out that the guy who blew up his house, he's called the Sokovian. Guess where he's from? He's protected now by Hyde. Hyde makes an appearance. Not for long because... Joe Garrison gets in a fight with him and decides he's hungry, so feeds him a massive dose of mutant growth hormone. Not exactly the healthiest of things, as it seems to kill Hyde, at least, or put him down. And then at the end, he ends up having a decision where the Sokovian uh, is done with, art, with having armies protect him, 
he takes a hostage as a train goes between him and Joe Garrison. So Joe Garrison is like, okay, this guy can lead me to my uh, to the guy who murdered my family, but he's but he's gotten innocent. So he ends up you know doing something the Punisher, the original Punisher probably would do, and you know, ventilates his skull essentially. And then he realizes, yep, it's time to get back to work. So I like the art. And I like the story, but I don't think I don't think they did enough to make it its own story, because when the Punisher Volume Two, you know, helped give uh, Frank his ongoing series, he came in. He had his uh, he had his tech guru Microchip. Well, started out with Microchip and his son until Microchip's son got murdered, and you know, Microchip's able to help him with all the computers and other stuff. This guy comes in with his family murdered, and he's got a uh, shield handler who can get him any type of armaments he wants, including rail guns, you know, advanced weaponry that, you know, most people wouldn't be able to get their hands on, unfortunately. So I think this definitely sets him up as a decent Punisher because he, like Frank, when he has a goal, he basically heads to that goal with no mercy for the bad people, which is fine because we all know that Frank, he stopped people being bad. And this guy really seems to enjoy making people stop being bad. So I think the setup, it gives us what could be a decent new Punisher, but I'm hoping that as it goes on, you know, they change him, allow, you know, allow him to be his own, uh, variation instead of like you know just another man with the same same tragedy as frank same strategies as frank you know i i'd really like to see joe garrison end up being you know his own punisher instead of you know in the shadow of frank and that's a pretty big shadow considering that the punisher has been a character for almost 50 years so but yeah so far i i'm okay with it i just want to see it you know branch out a little more no, I, I said I got the first three ordered. I haven't got any, got the first one yet. But then after listening to a bunch of people talk about it, I decided to drop off after volume three just to see where it goes or whatever, see what other people talk about. You think this is going the mythical route since you're dealing with demons? Uh, well, there weren't, well, the demons, they weren't really demons. It was a demon club. These were people who would wear Oni masks and have, uh, you know, like special weapon, like they they look won't be more like electric weapons. Is more like you know they're we're the demon gang type thing. So Hyde Hyde was the only real well character in there. Well, Hyde himself was was a character who uh, I remember reading him like in a Hulk comic from the eighties. He was the guy who ended up getting injected with some uh, with some type of experimental steroid. He's actually a uh, a uh, scientific doctor or scientist and he you know he can he's like the hulk you know you sh when uh joe shot him with the rail gun the projectile basically just bounced off of him hyde has gone against thor so he's so he's pretty powerful so yeah i know, I know when i listened to i don't know if it was john centris's podcast or one of the other ones that had the creators on and they were talking about it and stuff, they were like bringing up that they wanted to get away from the old Frank Punisher thing that with the cops putting the symbol on their vest and other people using Frank's symbol and trying to make him more of a somewhat civilized style Punisher. It's like, well, a Punisher for the people is what they said. And it's like, I always felt Frank was the Punisher for the people. I mean, he was taking out the evildoers that were yeah. human was, traffickers and all that shit. But yeah. yeah, he was also focusing on his own thing too, but he was helping the people out. And that's why I didn't like the way they were saying they wanted to change that type of philosophy with the, the new Punisher. But yeah, I, I'm really happy you reviewed it because I wanted to know your views on it. But yeah, I, I got the first three coming, but I held off after that. Yeah, I know. Like I said, it's 
it seems like they're starting over with the basic premise from the 1980s, except in this case, in, because uh, in several limited series in the beginning, uh, Frank ended up actually killing the people who were responsible for his family's death, and then he just kept his war going. In this case, this series seems to be like back in that series in the 70s, where because he's been... Uh, his his family has been killed, but since he's the only person whose body wasn't there, they think he did it, or he's obviously, you know, what they call a person of interest, at least. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know. The Punisher, who's got his own, you know, who already has his own person who, you know, his own tech person whose technological knowledge is way beyond what most other people were. I mean, that was microchip back then. I mean, he was hacking computers before the internet existed. So, so yeah, I want this to ch I, I I want this to branch out. I want to like it. Right now, I like it, but I mean, if it keeps doing this, it's like, well, then just give us Frank back. Yep. <laughs> yep. Alrighty, uh, from Punisher to. Squish and Squash, number one. Squish and Squash are two young cadets trying to make it into the intergalactic search and rescue squad. In order to become rescuers, they must pass the difficult Save the Gimbalman simulation test. It's not going to be easy, especially with tough Captain Toomey breathing down their necks. Breaking the rules and saving the crew from a burning galactic cruise ship lands our two cadets in trouble. The duo are given one last chance to pass the test or be thrown out of the academy for good. Our adventurous heroes must find new and imaginative ways to earn their patch and become bona fide rescuers. Squish, Squish and Squash is a cartoony sci-fi adventure story about friendship and courage, perfect for readers of all ages. This is done by uh, Niall O'Rourke, Mike Hardigan, and Justin Birch. All right. This is a Keen Spot release. Uh, the title, Squish and Squash, and seeing the design of our cat and elephant characters, I'm fairly certain this was a book that I was going to pick up anyways. I had the extra incentive that uh, Matt Rogers here did this variant cover that I'm holding up. If you are only hearing this, then you can check us out on YouTube and hit subscribe to see the video version. So once I saw that, I'm like, well, now my purchase is definitely secured. Um, this is a ton of fun. Uh, brand new characters. Doesn't waste any time to jump into the adventure. Uh, we have an action scene right off the bat as we have a family that are kind of like touring this volcano and it starts erupting and, be, you know, there was a big problem right at the start. And it doesn't waste any time to jump into our hero Squish and Squash coming to save the day and hoping to rescue uh, the Gimbalmans. And uh, what's interesting about this here is that we we start off action pack. You get a good taste of what this book is really going to be about. And it's part of the synopsis. But we immediately are taken to a simulation and we realize that it's almost like a danger room situation with the X-Men that they are just going through a test. They're trying to get their rescuing badges and it appears that they've been trying to uh, save the Kimballmans in the simulation several times now. And uh, the person in charge basically is giving them, you know, one more shot to do it. Uh, there's people that are in the cadets, uh, Right here, they're at this um, at this space diner, and then there's some uh, characters next to uh, next to them who are just always constantly laughing at Squish and Squash for always getting in trouble, for always failing. These are the ones that have passed the test and know what they're doing. Squish and Squash are down on their luck, and they they still have the passion to try to complete this thing. Um, but when they get set on to an adventure in this first issue. Um, they go to this uh, planet in which they essentially uh, aren't so much rescuing as they are just kind of helping with some chores around the house from a from a person in need. So there's a lot of comedy elements here. You get a lot of teases of them wanting to just jump into this action. And then you just kind of see where they're just kind of brought to reality of, you know, their position that they're not really at that stage to be these, uh, you know, rescuing cadets here. Um 
And there is a bit of heart in here. I'm not going to talk about the story much further here other than just uh, very overall themes. Uh, there's definitely a lot of heart in here. As you find out, one of the characters has a history with uh, a parent that has been part of this cadet uh, league or uh, group, squad, whatever you want to call them. And, um, and that actually does, you know, rather than it just being like a silly animal book and adventure and laughs and things like that. Uh, there is a bit of heart that is brought into it that um, is very um, nicely woven into it. Uh, but yeah, this was a ton of fun. The characters are fun. The designs are cute. I love the color palettes. Uh, get a little more example of our squish and squash characters there. And uh, yeah, this this was an absolute blast. Much like my super fun altogether. Like it's a, you know, it's a hefty story. There's a lot to look at and audiences for everybody you know and it's yeah uh i know there's a couple issues that are available in pre-orders um i have to look to see if i went ahead and uh doubled and tripled down or not um but i definitely need to uh make sure i do get the future copies because squish and squash is definitely a lot of fun so that is issue number one from keen spot entertainment um and because we always say it with keen spot books you can go to keenspotshop.com unofficial sponsor of the crimson call comic club based on we read a lot of their stuff there we go all right um i think that was it for both kirby and katie so we're gonna circle around to eric for the final section or final round of our uh, weekly reviews what all you right. got i've got kill your darlings one and two it's uh, it seems to be a fantasy series by Image. Um, strange story. I'm still not sure what's going on after two issues. Uh, it starts out first two issues. They have a parallel story. Starts out with, you know, a bunch of people having a barbecue, i.e., witch being burned at the stake. So you know, lovely you know little family activity. Then it cuts to uh, an epic battle of sorry, get the glare off of here of really cartoonish creatures, all led by a little girl named Rose. And you find out that the whole uh, the whole yeah, it's down back. The whole battle it's actually happening in her head, and she's like having this battle with her stuffed animals she's doing the voices she her i guess her favorite assistant is an ella pig with an australian accent named wallace so you see that this girl she has these battles she has this story that she writes in her head she creates she creates this like beautiful imaginative landscape of the kingdom of rosewood but while, you know, all this sappy stuff is going on, her family, or, you know, she lives with her mother, just, just her mother. Mother's having problems with bills, making making things meet. Sometimes her mother will play with her in the world. Sometimes her other friend who comes in here will play with her. I forget what his name is. but So, you know, then later at night, she continues her story. And looks like what she does she sees us and she enters her she enters her cartoon world and well that's not ketchup you know the other one around her is dead and she's trying to figure out what happened and a voice tells her this uh <clears throat> this great terrible evil swept through this land and and she's like well who are you a great and terrible evil so it emerges then she would then she comes to outside of her outside of her home and her house is on fire and all she, all all she can ask is where's ma so yeah that was one heck of a left turn near the end of the story but then when it continued on to the second to the second one also, like I said, it had a parallel story. This one took place eight years later after the first one, and you find out that the witch who was burn, burned at the stake didn't burn. She's still alive. 
and of course, witch hunters there after her. And she's upset because she screams, we're supposed to be safe here. And you see that the forest comes alive, kills the witch hunters. I'm sure there will be an intersection of this somewhere. But also the other story fast forwards eight years. So she's almost an adult. Or Rose is almost an adult. Her childhood friend is the only one who visits her. I mean, even though she's in like a mental facility, she's somewhat of an outcast because everybody thinks that, she, you know, she started the fire that killed her mother. And, you know, all evidence points to that. She, you know, she's obviously medicated, so she doesn't really have her old world or Rosewood anymore. But her friend still visits her to play, you know, what's called beat em beasts, which looks to be like a Pokemon-ish type type thing. And this is her new, new life until one night, sprinklers go off, arrows are being shot into the facility. And we don't know why the heck are there arrows in the facility. Who uses the bow and arrow? And then she sees her old friend Wallace, as she saw him when she do her old, um, you know, when she would, you know, fight her battles. He ends up shooting a lot of people with blow darts and arrows that have a rock at the end of them. Pops him in the head and he's like, crikey, he'll sleep that off. So she escapes because, you know, a lot of time, a lot of times she would end up at, outside at night talking to her old friend. But it turns out that her friend is also able to see Wallace, the Ella pig. And Wallace tells her that, yeah, I know this happened, but the Kingdom of Rosewood is still fighting a battle and we have a problem, so we need you back. So, again, two issues. I'm still not 100% sure what's going on. Um, does she descend from the witches? Uh, it, does Rosewood actually have a parallel in the real world, which caused the fire while, you know, her, her imaginary world is being destroyed? I don't really know. And problem is that most stories, when I don't really know something, I have to see where it goes next. So I'm probably just going to keep reading this to find out what's happening. So, I mean, I like the art. I like the premise. It, you know, it's enough so that you think you might know what's going on. So, but I don't know. It's like I said, it's, I'm rambling, but, you know, I just want to see where it goes next. And I think author, what, what the author Ethan S. Parker and uh, Griffin Sheridan, their story writing in this is pretty good. So, interesting fantasy. I just don't know what to, actually what to classify it as yet because again, don't know what's going on. So, if you like the weird, the weird mystery type of things, that I think Kill Your Darling would definitely be something you'd enjoy. Yeah, I had talked about this a while back, and a little insight. Uh, both of those writers, this is their first comic. Started off as young comic fans, as uh, a lot of people do, and uh, getting under the wing of uh, Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman, becoming friends with them and kind of running their sub stack. And then this is their first comic. Um, I'm very excited for the series as well. I would agree with the fact that, you know, you don't know what's going on. And that is very intriguing. We're not in a confusing way of like, you know, what's what's this book even about? I don't even want it. It just makes you like, all right, they have a mission um i think i talked about with going back to that witch scene in the very opening of that first issue kind of proves that they have a real like long planned out idea of this world that they built knowing that they go back to uh i'm assuming he's saying shut up to an animal and not to me um yeah. Yeah. and uh <laughs> um knowing that like you get those two very different scenarios of a witchcraft and a burning scene jumping into like a little girl's bedroom playing with her stuffed animals and stuff to me that's just like oh they 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 have a big idea here they've got it all mapped out and we just have to hang on for the ride and figure out where the heck it's going but yeah we 
I would say we'd have pretty similar reviews in that sense of how to classify this book, but yeah. Yeah, I was curious about that, but with that name, that's nothing I expected for a storyline. <laughs> yeah, I, I talked about I just bought it blindly just because of them, and, you know, I figured, oh, I'll support their first book, and then, uh, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to read more, that's for sure, so. Cool. All right, well, that is going to do it for the weekly reviews, but we do have one more segment, and that is the news. And now the news. This is part one of two of our previews previews. We're going to jump into these December catalogs, first starting with the Marvel and the DC ones. And then in our next episode, we'll do the giant previews catalog with the independent publishers and the merchandising and the apparel and collectibles. But we're going to kick it off with a Marvel. I've got a couple things flagged here. Um, this thing caught my attention, Avengers Twilight, number three of six. So we're halfway through a miniseries that I wasn't intending on reading. I know nothing about it, but Chip Zdarsky is the writer. Daniel Acuna is an artist, so it's a great uh, team right there. But um, even though she's not listed in the synopsis, but she is on two two of the variant covers. Um, but uh, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel towering over here uh we see her down here as well with an iron man and a captain america based on the synopsis i don't think this is the tony stark stark iron man that we know of i don't know if this is a a series of one shots within a six issue thing but because she's on it and that's actually a pretty sweet cover i'm going to check out issue number three and then i think i'm going to peek at issue number one when that comes out and kind of see what's going on with it but so yeah, all it takes for Marvel to get me to jump in halfway of a miniseries I wasn't buying, uh, throw Kamala Khan on there, uh, two covers nonetheless, so we'll see what happens. Avengers Twilight, number three. Uh, now I need to ask, Twilight, we're not going to see Edward or Bella here, are we? You know, looking at cover C here, it's very sparkly, it's kind of bright, I can't tell what's happening here, but it oh, might no. be Edward, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Disney Disney bought uh, the Twilight franchise, and now those characters are going to exist into, you know, we're going to see Blade and Bella get into a romance in an upcoming uh, miniseries. And... <laughs> All right, let's jump over to uh, Kirby. Anything? For uh, yeah, I got, I got What If Venom number one. I'm getting it because of the blank cover, but if it's an ongoing, I probably won't stick with it. I usually expect my what ifs to be a one issue one shot but black blank very oh that doesn't matter in a familiar church tower the venom symbiote was burned by peter parker and found a willing host in the vengeful and wrathful eddie brock or at least that's the story you know from rising stars jeremy holt and jesus hervaz comes an all-new look at what makes the Marvel Universe's most sinister symbiote tick, with a journey that can re that reimagines its earliest days bonded to a host with a rage and temper entirely different from those of Eddie Brock. It just it doesn't say one shot, and I have a feeling the way they they describe that it might go longer. Five issues. Okay, but I'm gonna get at least a blank cover, and we'll see what the next issues say about it and we'll go from there and do you know it says it on my end but you know it's a black blank cover yes okay and i'm happy with that yeah just making sure not that you get it be like what the heck <laughs> no i like I'm, I'm more into the colored ones lately just got to get the right markers to go yeah. with it before i test out on them <laughs> yeah i think this might be their second or third round of them doing these i think chip sadarsky started it with the a modern day what if with doing um mini series opposed to the one shots and i don't have it nearby but i just recently got my second omnibus of the classic what ifs it's probably about this big it's got you know thousand plus pages and uh so they've been collecting all of the the original what ifs now in two omnibuses omnibi and then uh and then the what if season two on disney plus comes out uh the week of christmas I think Christmas between New Year's and Christmas, where rather than an episode a week, 
they're going to drop an episode every day on Disney Plus of the new What If season. So that's their Christmas present to us. So What If is very hot right now. Yeah, I love What If, but I was just always so used to the one shots. So. What If? Uh, what If was five issues. That's the <laughs> new series. Uh, what If It Was Longer? Uh, well, it is a one issue. <laughs> uh, jump over to, to Katie. What you got? So I don't have much new from Marvel, but I'm still pumped about the Thrawn Alliances book. Uh, number two is coming out in February, and there's a Captain Panaka variant cover, which I thought was interesting because that character does not get a ton of attention. But uh, Marvel's doing a bunch of variant covers for Black History Month, and that is one of them. Um, I'm still pumped for this. I can't wait to review it and bring it to the club. But other than that, I'll do a Marvel club pick, but I don't have anything else uh, currently that I'm going to pick out from Marvel. Okay, Eric, anything? Uh, yeah, audio? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, you know, after looking through it, I really can't find anything new that they're putting out that, you know, piques my interest. So it's mostly just the ongoings. Fair enough. Uh, we have a four issue mini series uh, from Steve Orlando and Lorenzo Tometa, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Number one, uh, Scarlet Witch is definitely one of my favorite characters. Um, I'm excited to see that it's a mini series because you know I haven't been consuming as much uh comics as I would like, and when I see a promise of a mini series, that gets me excited of just getting getting your story and jumping in, jumping out. Old rivalry rivalries and new mysteries. The Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver have been heroes, friends, family heads, and uh, occasionally villains. But above it all, they are twins who look out for each other. So when Wanda receives a letter from the recently deceased Magneto that would upset Pietro, she burns the letter before her brother can read it. But her choice drives them apart at the worst possible time. A new threat heralded by the wizard with a horrifying eldritch upgrade is coming for their heads. And if they can't find a way to repair their damaged bond, it will cost them their lives. Um... All I need to know is Scarlet Witch, so I'm picking up Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, number one. Kirby? Isn't Quicksilver Scarlet Witch's son? Uh, nope. Um, that would be, I think his name is Speed within the comics, but... Oh. <clears throat> Hold on here. <laughs> yeah, <I> was... <laughs> uh, Quicksilver, their brother and sister, twins. Okay, yeah, that's... yeah. Yeah, we don't like to talk about what they did in the Ultimate Universe. <laughs> uh, Wiccan and Speed are her children. Those are the, the superhero names. Um, but yeah, so in case maybe you saw, that's what you're thinking of, maybe? Yep, that's the um, ones. And then, uh, did you have a pick? Uh, the only other Marvel one I will be picking up that's uh, issue one is Spectacular Spider-Man number one, because it's also a blank cover and i want to do a spidey cover but it does not have any description for what it's going on about this month so <laughs> that was the it for me for marvel okay i've got three more tabs and then we'll jump over to dc um the women of marvel number one a one shot uh gail simone and more i thought that was cool to see her name and then and more there's going to be more people but celebrating the mighty women of marvel they do uh one of these every year i believe uh this one has Scarlet Witch, Captain Marvel, Ms. Marvel, all three of them are on the same cover. Um, so it's definitely getting my money there. But yeah, so Women of Marvel number one, which is often, you know, just um, you know, an anthology, one shot, multiple stories, multiple creative teams. So I will be checking that out. Um, another one here, uh, Star Wars Mace Windu, uh, four issue miniseries. Uh, normally, uh, I haven't been reading as much Star Wars as I used to, where I used to just get everything. I just got overloaded with it. But what caught my attention with this one is that the this one is written by Mark Bernardin, who is from uh, Fat Man Beyond uh, with Kevin Smith, a uh, writer and director in his own right. He's written a lot of comics, um, and uh, he gets to play in the Star Wars universe. I know he's a big Star Wars nerd. And the fact that he gets to play with uh, Mace Windu in this miniseries is just awesome. So one of the greatest mm -hmm. Jedi must stop an indi um, incendiary. Uh, is that a Star Wars word or a word I just don't incendiary. know? Incendiary. Incendiary. 
Um, Secret from Falling into the Wrong Hands. But yeah, Mark Bernard and uh, George's Genty are teaming up. And uh, awesome. Yeah, uh, Genty I know from a lot of Buffy comics and stuff. So I'm happy I'm about both too. of those creators for Star Wars Mace Windu 104. And then... Much like that Marvel uh, Super Stories I talked about with the, that brand new graphic novel with a bunch of short stories. I don't know if this is part of their new... Uh, yeah, I think it's from the same pub... pub I can't speak. Uh, publisher Amulet. Uh, but they have Spider-Man Animals Assemble and Spider-Man Quantum Quest uh, that are graphic novels that are coming out. And based on the promotion here, it definitely looks like it's going to be in that same vein where it's all just, you know, a fun, all ages, outside of continuity graphic novel. Uh, I should mention that the Spider-Man animals assemble. It looks like uh, Tippy Toe is riding on the top of Spider-Man there. So not that Kirby needed to find an extra, you know, $12 in the budget, I'm guessing. I don't know how much these are. Um, but uh, there's, I see Goose, I see Lucky the Pizza Dog. I see a, is that, does Nick Fury have a gerbil? Because there is a gerbil with an eye patch down here. I don't know if it's visible, but um, oh. there's a gerbil with an eye patch. So yeah, I feel like I've seen that gerbil before somewhere. But but I don't yeah, know. Th this looks like a lot of fun. And then there's one Quantum Quest with the Fantastic Four. But yeah, I really, really loved what they put together with that Marvel Super Stories. And I'm pretty sure this is the same publisher. And uh, yeah, I, I got a feeling I'm going to buy a lot of these. Much like the the DC for kids uh, line where they have their original graphic novels that are just letting the creator do their stuff. You don't have to read all of the other things that are going on in normal comics. So. All right. So that is it for Marvel. Um, let's kick it over to Kirby then, if you want to uh, start off with DC. Okay. This one's still an iffy one for me yet. I'm not sure. Cause I'm not big on the Batman anymore right now, but, I'm thinking about checking out Red Hood, The Hill, number zero by DC Comics. Before you embark on Red Hood's newest adventure in The Hill, experience the story that introduced Jason to his new home. As the Joker War ravages Gotham, a new vigilante group has formed to protect their turf, and Red Hood finds himself caught in the crossfire. This thrilling tale collects Red Hood Outlaw number 51 and 52, and is essential reading to get you ready for all hell to come to the hill in Red Hood the Hill, which will be coming out with issue number one a week after this issue comes out. And this storyline, Welcome to the Hill, formerly one of Gotham's most dangerous suburbs, a place that required its residents to band together to keep themselves safe when the police, and sometimes even Batman, wouldn't. Now, as the hill finds itself gent gentrifying, old habits die hard as the vigilante, known only as Strike, works with her team to keep the town safe, but she's not alone. Jason Todd, one of the hill's newest residents, is more than happy to don the visage of Red Hood to help Strike keep his new home safe, but a new villain is emerging from the shadows. Will Red Hood strike in the hills small militia of vigilantes be able to keep their home safe? Check out Red Hood's return to find out. I'm debating. I'm, I, I think I'm going to pull the trigger, but definitely not sure. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to have to tune into this podcast to find out what happens. Um, let's jump over to Katie. Anything from D.C.? Sure. So I'm excited for uh, Batman Generation Joker. This is from the White Knight universe. Uh, this is, so in the White Knight world, uh, Harley had twin children with Jack Napier, and the daughter uh, has grown up to favor the Joker a little bit more. Um, there was a big time jump from um, Curse of the White Knight to Beyond the White Knight, like 10, 15 years or so. So now the uh, kid is a teenager, and I'm excited to see more of her story uh, explored through this trade paperback. This must be an advanced solicit. I thought this was coming out in April, but uh, you can get Batman the White Knight Presents Generation Joker, and it's retailing for $25. Uh, check it out. 
Well, cool. Eric, yeah, I actually read that one. It's a pretty good one. Nice. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Looking forward to it. So, and well, moving on. I hate to sound like a broken record, but I don't know. The mainstream publishers, they don't seem to be really pushing much out that interest me lately. So, yeah, yeah. I don't looked at DC and I'm like, eh. Yeah, we felt that going. trend with we felt that trend with the last catalog where uh didn't really have too much and it seems like uh it's almost the same again. Yeah. Um so the indie fighters are pumping them out and doing a good job with it. And I don't wanna sound like a broken record, but I have zero new picks from DC outside of my ongoing Wonder Woman, Birds of Prey, and Harley Quinn books that I read over there. So um so be, uh kirby anything from dc uh the only other thing i'm considering is scooby-doo where are you number 126 because it's a little vampire love story for valentine's that might be the only valentine's book i'll pick up but Ooh. yeah that's it for me for dc cool cool and uh, i forget now um katie did he have anything else uh no thank you i i think i'm done with dc right now nothing else for me all right. Well, that is going to do it then. Um, there's a lot of stuff in those catalogs, though, that you should check out, not only with the ongoing series, but also with the uh, collected editions and things like that that you can always jump on. So we always recommend to check out the previews for yourself. Those are just some of the picks that we recommend. All right. Jumping into the last portion here is plugs. Check out CrimsonCowl.com for info and original web comics. Uh, subscribe to the audio version on iTunes, Crimson Call Comic Club on iTunes. You can subscribe, rate, and review. That will help us out. Go to Crimson Call Comic Club on YouTube if you want the video version. Hit subscribe, hit like, send us a comment, share with a friend. But yeah, if you want the uh, what I call the full edition, um, seeing the whole experience of us here, uh, check it out on YouTube. And then The Crimson Cowl, all one word on Instagram. If you want to email us, uh, Crimson Cowl Comic Club at yahoo.com. Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Anything you'd like to promote for what just came out or what's on the horizon? Still just got some more comic book review videos out and some unpacking videos and some that I should have had out already that I will get out by the time this is out, hopefully. So. All right. So check out Under the Call of MS wherever you get your podcast as well as YouTube. I have some art accounts over on Instagram and Facebook, Anthony Latch, L-A-A-T-S-C-H. And then I am the host and co-creator of Cartoonist by Night on YouTube. We got a brand new episode with D. Brad returning, a three for all episode that is out there. Um, it's a week old at, at the time of this episode dropping. Uh, and then... Uh, the other thing to talk about, speaking about a week old, um, at the time of this recording, we are one week away until the uh, uh, Mighty Con convention. So basically, uh, that is coming up. Um, that came up already. It's coming up in one day. That's the math. <laughs> it's coming up in one day. So if you watch this and listen to this episode right now, uh, pack up your bags, go to MightyConShows.com and get your tickets and go to Madison to see David Gloyd, David Gloyd II, and myself, along with a friend Vince Wilson, as Crimson Color Media will be there selling some stuff. And uh, on this very podcast in the very near future, um, David and David will have a fun reveal for everybody, or at least one of the Davids. That's why they have to both be Davids, so that we can at least get one of the two Davids at least. So that's all I got to say. I think I got all that math right. When you mm -hmm. see this, then Mighty Con is one day from now. But to everybody in this current room right now, yeah, you know, one more week yet. So that is going to do it. That's the last round of promotion for that. It's going to do it for this episode. We will return for a couple more episodes in December, I believe, at least one, if not two more. And But that's going to do it for this one. This whole time, I've been eating a tuna sandwich while you rescue a cat. I've been sparking up the magic with my little unicorn. I've been chasing UFOs in the middle of nowhere. I've been wondering why all my imaginary friends are dead. To be continued.
Thank you, Slimer.